Congratulations, you made it to church. You survived the blizzard of 2018. Amen. Praise the Lord. God is good. If you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to come over with me to Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19. While you're headed there, just want to remind you, all of our young adults are invited for lunch and fellowship after church next Sunday. We are getting ready to uh, relaunch our young adults fellowship. There's going to be weekly meetings that will take place every Thursday evening starting in March. There will also be uh, social gatherings at other times during the month, so reserve that date. Uh, lunch is going to be at the Coach Diner in Port Chester at 2 o'clock next Sunday. If you need directions there, you can check the website. And then don't forget the membership club class next Sunday at 5 p.m. If you worship with us regularly, you are part of our church family, but if you've never been through our membership class, you're not yet officially a member of Harvest Time Church. If you're interested in jumping into that, you can call the church office during the week, and that starts at 5 p.m. Uh, we'll be together for a couple of hours. We are not able to provide child care uh, for that, but we will be uh, serving a light supper for you. All right, Luke chapter 19. <clears throat> Going to begin reading at verse 28, and the Bible says, Jesus went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. And it came to pass, when he drew near to Bethpage and Bethany, at the mountain called Olivet, that he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go into the village opposite you, where, as you enter, you will find a cult tied, on which no one has ever sat. Loose it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, why are you loosing it? Thus you shall say to him, because the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went their way and found it just as he had said to them. But as they were loosing the colt, the owners of it said to them, why are you loosing the colt? And they said, the Lord has need of him. Then they brought him to Jesus and they threw their own clothes on the colt and they set Jesus on him. And as he went, many spread their clothes on the road. Then, as he was now drawing near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But he answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. Now as he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, If you had known, even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you and close you in on every side, and level you and your children within you to the ground. And they will not leave in you one stone upon another, because you did not know the time of your visitation. Then he went into the temple and began to drive out those who bought and sold in it, saying to them, It is written, My house is a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves." And he was teaching daily in the temple, but the chief priests, the scribes, and the leaders of the people sought to destroy him and were unable to do anything, for all the people were very attentive to hear him. My message this morning is entitled, Don't Miss Your Appointed Day. Don't miss your appointed day. Let's pray together and let's invite the help of the Holy Spirit as we look into the word of God together this morning. Heavenly Father, we come to you in the beautiful name of Jesus this morning. We thank you so much for the gift of your word. It is truly the lamp for our feet and the light for our pathway. Jesus said that the word of God is like seed. So, Father, we ask you that you would touch our hearts in these next few minutes. Would you let them be good soil, soil that can receive and retain and bear fruit from the word of God. Lord Jesus, you said the words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. So would you send your spirit to minister life to us from your word today? If you agree with that, would you say amen and amen? Well, if you've been away on winter break, you may be wondering why we're sharing today from the story of what we call Palm Sunday and Jesus' triumphal entry into the city of Jerusalem. After all, Palm Sunday doesn't come around for another few weeks, but there's a good reason why we're in this passage today. In this season of Lent, a time of spiritual preparation as we approach Good Friday and Easter, we're taking a special journey together. 
For the next few Sundays, beginning with today's message, we'll be walking with Jesus through the days of Passion Week. Now that expression, Passion Week, doesn't really have to do with Christ's great love toward us, but it comes from Latin where the word passion meant suffering. In other words, the passion of Christ is everything that he suffered for us in order to bring us home to God up to and including the cross. So over these next few weeks, we're going to see how Jesus spent the final six days of his earthly ministry. On each one of these Sundays together, we're going to explore a different day of the Passion Week leading up to Jesus' death on Good Friday and his resurrection on Easter morning. Today, I'm sharing about the Sunday of that week, and next week, Pastor Glenn's going to share with you about Monday of Passion Week and so on. So each Sunday, we're going to look at what Jesus did, see what he experienced, and together, we're going to be challenged by his words. To help you follow along with us and study the Passion Week in more detail, we've set up a special Facebook group where we're going to share scriptures and be able to talk together. The name of that group is The Last Days of Jesus, so you can find it easily. We're also leaving a handout in the lobby for you if Facebook's not your thing. There's scriptures there with reading and meditation for each day of this coming week. So you can check that out uh, in the lobby after service today or just uh, join that Facebook group and you'll receive those scriptures there. Every one of these messages is going to be centered on Jesus. And so we want to encourage you to invite someone to church who needs to hear about the love of Christ. Well, this morning we've read Luke's account of a scene that's familiar to every Christian. And it's a very powerful picture. The three-year ministry of Jesus has rocked Israel. And now it's reaching its climax. Passover is approaching. And the capital city of Jerusalem is beginning to fill up with pilgrims from all across the Roman Empire and even beyond. During the Passover, every Jewish man was required to come to the temple and celebrate how God had delivered his people from slavery centuries before. In obedience to that command, pilgrims were flowing toward the city. You know, as the feast drew closer, they would swell Jerusalem from 80,000 people or so, which was already chaotic, into perhaps a quarter of a million. They would turn King David's city into a hotbed of devotion, mixed together with powerful resentment for the occupying Roman army. And this was the most exciting Passover that Jerusalem had seen in centuries. For many years now, there had been a rising tide of anticipation. First, John the Baptist had come, seemingly out of nowhere, telling Israel to prepare the way because the Lord was about to appear. John had a massive impact on the nation. And the Gospels tell us that everyone was wondering if perhaps John might be the Messiah. But John denied it and said, no, somebody's coming after me, somebody whose shoe I am not even worthy to untie. John said, I came to tell you about that one who's coming after me. And then, just as John had predicted, the ministry of Jesus broke forth. And every day, the people of Judea saw a new miracle and another demonstration of the love of God through the hands of the Master. Every time he taught, Every time he spoke, people heard heavenly words that had never yet been heard on this earth. The authority of God was administered through his command, and the power of God was released as he touched the leper and the outcast. You know, if John's ministry had been surrounded by excitement, then the ministry of Jesus set Israel on fire. His enemies plotted against him because they said, the whole world has gone after him. But the common people testified in favor of Jesus, saying, we've never seen it like this in Israel before. As the Passover season began, expectation reached its peak. Luke describes for us here the depth of feeling in verse 37. He says, the whole multitude of the disciples began to praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen. Not understanding what was waiting for Jesus, we can imagine that the crowds wanted him to use his power to destroy the hated Romans with fire. 
You know that on at least one other occasion, they had wanted to take Jesus and make him their king. So this was the perfect time, or so they reasoned. Hadn't the prophets foretold that one day the Messiah would stand upon the Mount of Olives as Jesus did that Sunday morning and then fight against the Gentile nations with the power of heaven? After all, what else could there possibly be left for Jesus to do? But Jesus came riding that morning, not on a white horse, but on the colt of a donkey. You see, it was the way that Israelite kings used to ride in times of peace. So yes, Jesus was fulfilling prophecies, but not prophecies of judgment. Instead, he was giving them a sign from heaven that he was coming to make peace. Five centuries earlier, Zechariah the prophet had foreseen it. He wrote, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. Jesus was coming to them in humility, coming to make peace between his heavenly father and a human race that had gone astray. So now, on that morning, for the first and only time, Jesus allowed himself to be hailed as a king by the people. The crowd acclaimed him as the son of David, Israel's Messiah. It meant that he, he was God's chosen king, anointed to bring deliverance to the people. And so they cried out, Hosanna, Hosanna. A phrase that means, save us now, drawn from Psalm 118, which was one of the songs that was sung during the Passover. You and I call it Palm Sunday because of the greeting that Jesus received. You know, waving palm branches and making a carpet out of your garments was the traditional way to greet a victorious king. Most of the crowd was rejoicing over Jesus with shouts of praise. A few were offended, to be sure. But one man was overcome with sorrow, and that man was Jesus himself. Jesus was overcome with sorrow because he could see what others could not. He could see the looming shadow of a cross. Jesus knew what nobody else there knew. He knew the spiritual needs of the people. He knew that sin had separated them from God and that they needed to be forgiven and they needed to be made whole. Out of all the people there, only Jesus understood that he must gain heaven for us first before the world could be improved. Friends, this is probably the only time in history that an entire city turned out for a parade without really knowing why. So as Jerusalem came into view, Jesus began to weep. The original Greek here indicates that this was more than just a little moisture at the corner of your eye. This was crying with audible sounds. It was heartfelt sorrow. And as Jesus wept, he explained the reason for her tear, his tears. He was longing for the people to grasp the things that would give them peace. That's an old painting there behind me. The name of that painting is, He Wept Over Her. Jesus said, if only you could understand what would bring you peace. I have good news for you today, church. In fact, I have the best news imaginable. Jesus is looking out over our city today. He's looking out over our homes, and he's looking out over our hearts, and he's saying, I've come to you today with an offer of peace. I've come with an offer of friendship from the God of heaven. I have come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. Amen. Jesus is saying to each one of us, I want you to understand the things that will bring you peace. What are those things? I see three things within this story that will help us to know and experience God's peace and God's wholeness. And I want to share them with you. Three things we need to do to have abundant life from God. And the first one is this. Receive Jesus as God's appointed deliverer. The first thing we need to do is welcome Jesus as God's appointed deliverer. 
You know, if the Palm Sunday crowd was right about anything at all, it was this. They knew that Jesus had been sent to demonstrate the power of the kingdom of God. Jesus had been performing signs and wonders all across the land of Israel, showing people that God had sent him to set the captives free as he operated in the power of heaven. You know, Jesus talked about that the very day that he began his public ministry. He said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. That should have gotten more than four people happy. I don't know. The Gospels show us how Jesus was the deliverer in three different ways. First, that Jesus was the prophet of God. The Bible says that Jesus didn't need anyone to tell him what was in men's hearts because he already knew. He revealed the secrets of men's hearts. The Samaritan woman at the well said about him, Come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. You know, Peter came to him one day because Peter was having a little problem with his taxes, but Jesus already knew why he'd come. Jesus called out people by name even though he had never met them before. He could uncover men's sins if he needed to, but instead he preferred to show Nathaniel that he knew all about Nathaniel's prayer life. Jesus lived in perfect communion with his heavenly father. And in Matthew's gospel, Matthew tells us that on Palm Sunday, the people said, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth. Not only is he the prophet of God, Jesus is the great physician. The Bible says he came with healing in his wings. People watched amazed as the dead were raised, lepers made whole, and people born blind began to see. Church, understand that when Jesus healed people, he showed us the heart of God. One man said to him, Jesus, if you're willing, you can make me clean. And Jesus said, I am willing, be made clean. And yet, you know, we only know a fragment of the miracles that he did. The end of John's gospel, John said that if everything that Jesus did had been written down, I suppose, John said, the whole world itself could not contain the books that would be required to write the miracles of Jesus. Jesus was God's appointed deliverer. He was a prophet, a healer, and he was also the divine invader. Jesus came to set the captives free. He showed his absolute authority over every unclean spirit, including Satan himself. The Bible says, for this reason, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Matthew recorded how Jesus could heal the sick and cast out demons all night long, if need be, to help people. Matthew says, when evening had come, they brought to him many who were demon-possessed, and he cast out the spirits with a word and healed all who were sick, so that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, he himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. Peter saw Jesus liberate tormented minds. And when he wanted to summarize the ministry of Jesus for some unbelievers, Peter summarized the ministry of Jesus like this. He said, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power. And he went around doing good and healing everyone who was oppressed by the devil because God was with him. No power of hell could stand against the Savior. Jesus said, I watched as Satan fell like lightning from heaven. And the ministry of Jesus, the Deliverer Church, continues on today. The Bible says that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He still heals broken bodies. He still gives a word by his Holy Spirit to open the hearts of men. His name still sends the powers of hell fleeing out in terror. Many people here can testify of his delivering power. Sometimes he uses no human agents. Other times he chooses to work and we see people being set free through the authority that he extends through his church. Jesus set the captives free in days of old 
and he can do the same for you this morning. What plagues you today? Is it alcohol? Is it drugs? Is it depression? Mental instability of some kind? He remains forever the son of righteousness, risen with healing in his wings for you. He can set you free. Will you receive him today? Will you welcome him as the deliverer and say, Hosanna, son of David, save me now? We're talking about three things that will bring us God's peace. The first thing we need to do is welcome Jesus as God's appointed deliverer. The second thing is this, receive Jesus as God's anointed king. We need to welcome Jesus as God's anointed king. You know, we often call Jesus the Messiah, which means the anointed one. In ancient times, people anointed kings with oil as a sign that the Holy Spirit had come upon them to empower them for their mission. It symbolized that they had been specially chosen by God and set apart. The Messiah, you probably know, is a Hebrew word, but the Greek word for that idea is the Greek word Christos, and that's where we get the word Christ. So church, I want you to remember this. Every time you say the name Jesus Christ, you are really saying that he is Jesus, the anointed one. Jesus is the king that God has chosen. He's the one upon whom God has placed his seal of approval. God spoke from heaven and said, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. He's the son of God. He's the captain of the host, the Lord of the armies of heaven, our lawgiver and our judge. And everything obeys him by the father's decree. In Hebrews chapter 1, we get a little window into the scene of heaven at Jesus' coronation. And God the Father says, let all the angels of God worship him. In Philippians 2, we read that God has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every other name. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee must bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus himself said all, I want you to say all. all, all authority has been given to me in heaven and in earth. And church, that teaches you and me how we welcome him as king. Friends, we will never experience God's peace. Listen to me, please. We will never experience God's peace unless we are ready to obey Jesus Christ. Unless we obey his voice, we will never experience his promise of abundant life. I need to welcome him as God's anointed king, and I need to acknowledge that he is fully entitled to rule my life. He is authorized to be my captain. Can we welcome him that way? Have we realized yet that there is wisdom, that there is safety in listening to the words of God's anointed king? How many of you know that we live in an independent age in which every man is encouraged to follow his own counsel and not inquire of the Lord? But we still need to look to his words, which Jesus said will never pass away. You remember that God told Joshua, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night so that you may observe to do according to everything that is written in it. Jesus said, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will compare him to a wise man who built his house upon a rock and the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house and it didn't fall because it was founded upon a rock. Follow the word of the Lord. Honor the word of the Lord. Be willing to obey the word of the Lord. Do you know the world is beginning to despise his ways? But the only thing that will keep us safe is to decide that God's way is the best way and commit to build our lives upon that word. Let's leave behind that mentality that says, oh, pastor, I know the Bible says I shouldn't do this, but 
Church, when we pick and choose between his commands, I can almost hear Jesus saying, oh, if only you knew what blessedness could be yours. If only you knew the things that would bring you peace. If we call him Lord, then let us honor him. If we call him Lord, then let us live as though we really believe that he has the right to rule. Only then can we experience his abundant life. And I know that just as Jesus has proven himself to be God's appointed deliverer, there are many testimonies in this room of how people began to be blessed once they honored him as king and started doing things God's way. They found a better pathway for themselves and for their family. Somebody ought to say amen to that. Maybe you once knew that truth and you wandered away from it. Maybe you tell yourself that you've built a life for yourself without God's interference. But deep down, you know there's no peace in it. Or maybe you've never known God in a personal way and you're wondering if Jesus can help you. I'm here to tell you today that he can and he will. Jesus said, take my yoke upon you. Are you tired of the burden? Take my yoke upon you, Jesus said, and you will find rest for your souls because my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Will you welcome him as king and say, Jesus, I acknowledge you as Lord and I surrender to your kingship. Teach me how to live. Three things that will bring us God's peace. Welcome Jesus as God's appointed deliverer. Welcome him as God's anointed king. And finally this, Receive Jesus as God's accepted lamb. We need to welcome Jesus as God's accepted lamb. This was the great mystery of Palm Sunday, hidden from the crowd. Jesus wasn't riding into Jerusalem that morning as the lion of the tribe of Judah, trampling on his enemies. He was coming as the lamb of God, coming to take away the sins of the world. If anyone had ears to hear that Sunday, the mystery would have been revealed because there was another noise there that the people could have heard after the shouting stopped, and it was the sound of sheep. See, the Passover was coming that week, and people were preparing to slaughter and eat the Passover lambs. You know, the number of lambs was staggering. The Romans were curious with all that activity, and they once conducted an investigation into how many lambs were killed at the Passover. And you know what they found? The number came to about 250,000. Literally millions of people might be eating the Passover in and around the area of Jerusalem. Now, in the law of Israel, God had given specific instructions as to how to eat the Passover and when. Passover was celebrated on the 14th day of the month of Nisan. Now, that's Nisan with one S. It's not Nisan like the automobile. So. But something important happened a few days earlier on the 10th of the month. On the 10th of the month of Nisan, the Israelites were commanded to bring the lambs into their dwellings, into their homes. All the way back in Exodus chapter 12, God said to Moses, Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month, every man shall take for himself a lamb, a lamb for a household. And the tenth day of Nisan was called Lamb Selection Day. On the tenth of that month, people brought a lamb into their homes, and they inspected it to make sure that it had no blemishes. It would then live with the family that week, and they would grow attached to it. On that particular year, the 10th of Nisan fell upon a Sunday. In fact, it was Palm Sunday. Think about it. While the Passover lambs were being brought into the city from nearby Bethlehem, where they were raised, Jesus, God's Passover lamb, who was also born in Bethlehem, was being brought into Jerusalem as well. What a picture. What a God. Jesus was inspected that week like every other lamb. As he entered Jerusalem, the people testified that he had no blemish. See, in just a few days, Pilate also would say, I find no fault in him. 
He was the spotless lamb of God. The Bible says he was tempted in every way, just like you and I are tempted. And yet he was without sin. He lived among the people that week, just like the Passover lambs lived in a Jewish home and might have become a pet for the children during those days. And every day of the Passion Week, Jesus was teaching the people and they grew accustomed to his voice and his face, just as the households there in the region got used to having a lamb in their midst. On that first Passover in Egypt long ago, the Israelites placed the blood of a lamb upon the doorposts because God had said, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And if they obeyed his command that night, God's angel of judgment would indeed pass over their house. And church, I want to tell you this morning that so it is with Christ. Upon the cross of Calvary, God placed my sins and yours upon Jesus, the innocent lamb. He allowed himself to be bound so that we could go free. He allowed himself to be struck so we could be healed. The Bible says that we deserve the penalty of death for our sins. But it also says that the father laid upon him, upon Jesus, the iniquity of us all. And now death can pass over me the way that it passed over Israel on the night of the Exodus. You see, when we apply the blood of Jesus to our lives, to the door of our hearts, God passes over us. And he won't enter into judgment with us. Instead, because of Jesus' sacrifice, God is now free to offer us forgiveness, offer us peace, offer us the adoption to become his sons and his daughters, praise God. If you believe in Jesus Christ, then the holy God, who the Bible says must punish sin, has already expended all of his righteous wrath against you. You see, he poured out his wrath for sin upon his own son, who lovingly endured it all voluntarily for our sakes. The Bible tells us, for scarcely for a righteous man will someone die. Yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God accepted that sacrifice of Jesus in our place. That is the good news of the gospel. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. Church, Jesus was God's accepted lamb. Will you receive Jesus today as your deliverer and king? Will you receive him as the lamb of God, the sacrifice that God accepted on your behalf? You see, none of us can earn heaven. Only I mean, even the most moral of us has fallen short of the holy demands of God's law. None of us can present a sacrifice of blood or money that can open heaven's door to us. But thank God there is a sacrifice that he has already accepted in my place. Jesus, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. So church, in closing today, I want to urge each one of us to come to him. Or maybe, for some of us, to come back to him. Jesus said in verse 42 of Luke 19, where we read earlier, If you had known, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. Have you ever missed an important appointment? Do you ever get that call from somebody that says, where were you? I was waiting for you. Do you ever have that dream that you missed your final exam and you're going up and down the halls of the school? Some of you have that dream even when you're 40, right? Jesus is talking here about an appointment that we dare not miss. Jesus, you see, is riding past your heart today, just as he rode past the crowd on the 10th day of Nisan. And the Spirit of God is whispering to our hearts the same thing that he whispered to them on Palm Sunday. 
this is the deliverer who can set you free. This is the king we must obey. And this is the sacrifice that can take away your sin. How will we answer? The Bible says, if today you hear his voice, harden not your hearts. Jesus said it was a special day. And so indeed it was. It was an appointed day. Jesus said it was their day. Jesus fulfilled an amazing Bible prophecy that morning. You can read about it in Daniel chapter 9, where the prophet Daniel was told by the angel Gabriel that God was giving Israel a mission. Wish you had time to go into that whole story today. We don't, but God was giving Israel 490 years to fulfill that mission. Don't get thrown off by that number. It does have a significance, but we don't have time to explore it today. Here's what we need to know for right now, though. The angel told Daniel that after 483 of those years had passed, the Messiah would come and be killed. However, Gabriel said he would not be killed for himself. Now, that's an amazing prediction. Most Jewish people don't know that their own scriptures say the Messiah would come and be killed for the sake of other people. And here's maybe the most remarkable part about it. The angel told Daniel when the countdown would begin so that people could keep track of it. And when we study that out, we discover something truly astonishing. Those 483 years after which the Messiah would come ended on a very important date. In fact, it's the very date that we've been discussing all morning. Bible scholars tell us that those 483 years ended in the same year Jesus died. In fact, they ended on the 10th day of the month of Nisan. In other words, this ultra-specific prophecy of Daniel was fulfilled exactly on Palm Sunday, just as the people were welcoming Jesus of Nazareth as Israel's Messiah. And only five days later, Jesus would indeed be killed, but not for himself. Not only did Daniel predict the year Jesus would be proclaimed as Messiah, he called it down to the day. But most of Israel missed what Jesus called the day of their visitation. And because of that, instead, his prophecy of judgment would come to pass. The Romans would soon destroy Jerusalem. Within 40 years' time, they would dig a trench around the city, just as Jesus had predicted, and trap everybody inside until they starved. And as Jesus also said, then the temple was destroyed so completely that not one stone remained standing on top of another stone. Listen, and Jesus said that Palm Sunday, if you had known, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace. See, that Palm Sunday was their day. It was a prophesied day that proves the Bible is true. It proves that Jesus is Israel's Messiah. That was their day. But tragically, they missed their appointment. Church, I want to tell you that by the grace of a living and loving God, today is your appointed day. Don't miss your appointed day the way that Israel missed hers. Messiah has come to you today with an offer of peace from heaven. Jesus wants to be your healer this morning. Will you receive God's appointed deliverer? Jesus wants to be your king today. He wants you to be blessed as you obey his words of life. Will you receive God's appointed king? Jesus wants to be your savior today. He wants you to be born again through the sacrifice of his blood upon the cross. Will you receive God's accepted Lamb. Today, church, Jesus is looking out at us with love, just as he looked out over the city on that first Palm Sunday. And now he wants us to know his peace. He's God's appointed deliverer. He's God's anointed king. And he's God's accepted lamb. Welcome him. Welcome him today, church, because today is your day. Don't miss your appointed day. Come on, stand together with me.